Welcome. Um, we're, we're very happy that all of you have decided to join us for the webinar. Um, and a special thank you to our panelists who are actually joining us from coast to coast. Uh, before we do anything, I want to make sure you know how to use the webinar tools. Um, so you'll see the ways for you to open and close the control panel, mute. Um, you'll, we'll be actually all on mute um, for this entire call. Um, and so when you have questions, um, what you will want to do is put them right here in the chat bar. Um, so during that Q&A period that we will have um, towards the end of the webinar, those are, are where we will be taking our questions from. So please put those questions right there. Um, so on this webinar, um, we'll spend a few minutes sort of introducing you to the panelists. Um, who have joined us. We'll talk for a few minutes about our work um, in, in districts. Um, and then we'll jump right into the Q&A period. So make sure that you don't wait until the Q&A to start putting your questions in. You can put those questions in throughout um, and we'll answer them at that point. Um, before we get started, I will share the most important information. Um, it's that we're hiring um, and we are hiring for Principal associate, associate and analyst positions. We'll tell you more um, about those throughout the webinar. Um, our analysts and associates will all start um, in September of 2018 as a hiring class together. Um, and for principal associate roles, we are more flexible on start date. Okay. So to introduce myself, um, I am Jessica Fick. I, I lead the talent and organizational development work here um, at ERS. Um, I have been with ERS for a little over three years now. Um, and before coming to ERS, I worked um, for four years in an organization called Citizen Schools um, in the ed reform space as well, um, and then spent some time working as a human capital consulting before transitioning back into doing this work in education. Um, so what we're going to do now um, is have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, each of them are going to share their position, how long they've been at ERS, um, where they were before ERS, and why they decided to join um, ERS initially. Um, so we'll start with Nisha. Hello, everyone. This is Nisha Garg. I'm a manager with ERS uh, based in the San Francisco office. I've been out here in the Bay Area for the last two years and then uh, was in the Watertown office for three years prior, bringing my total tenure at ERS to five years. I joined originally as an Education Pioneers Analyst Fellow following my stint in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, doing Teach for America. Um, and I joined ERS because uh, watching my students work as hard as they were working and having them go on to the worst middle school in the district was just too heartbreaking to continue pushing each day. And so I wanted to make sure that I was focusing on the systemic change that would actually change outcomes for my kids. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Stolitano. Uh, I joined ERS about two years ago. Uh, I came in as an associate, and then this past January, I was promoted to principal associate. Before ERS, I was uh, actually in the Marine Corps for 12 years. Uh, I was an officer and a pilot, but wanted to sort of make the tra transition to civilian world. And so I went to grad school, and while I was at grad school, saw and was sort of exposed to ERS's work. I think what was uh, I was drawn to was a couple things. One being the data-driven nature of our work in terms of how we try to gather and uh, conduct a lot of our analyses, as well as the mission. The idea of um, service I think is pretty important to me, and so ERS represented uh, a unique opportunity to do something I think really interesting, but then also had a great impact uh, around the United States. Hi everyone, my name is Roni Cepeda. I am an analyst here at ERS. I just wrapped up my, my first year and before ERS, I was actually in college. I came to ERS right after graduating uh, and obtaining my degree in economics. Uh, but while in college, I also did Breakthrough Collaborative. Uh, I was a teaching fellow and I also did Career Preparation uh, Fellowship from Management Leadership for Tomorrow, MLT. And why I decided to join ERS, I 
I knew from my fellowship with Breakthrough that I was really passionate about education, uh, that, that it was something that I want to dedicate my career for. But I also knew that I wanted to combine it with my analytics for my economics degree. And I do think that ERS is at that great intersection of, uh, of education and analytics and trying to change things from a systemic level. Great, thank you. Um, so before we go further and hear stories about the district work um, from each of our panelists, I'd like to share with you a little bit about ERS. Um, so at ERS, we believe that one school at a time reforms will not get our country to where it needs to be quickly enough. Um, many students are not receiving the access and opportunities um, that they need to grow, learn, and contribute um, in their communities. And therefore, we believe that we need to focus all of the resources across the system, the people, the time, and the money to ensure that every school succeeds for every student. Uh, we were founded just over 12 years ago, um, and since then we've worked closely with some of our nation's largest districts. Um, from here in Boston to Charlotte to Indianapolis to Denver um, to Los Angeles and Oakland. Um, so at this point I'm going to turn to our panelists and have each of them talk about one of the districts where they feel like they've made an impact or are hoping to make an impact in a current project. Nisha, go ahead. As Jess mentioned, uh, we've recently been working with Oakland Unified School District out here in California. Uh, two years ago, we engaged with them on what we refer to as a typical resource map, where we looked at how resources were being deployed across the district, whether in their central office or down at the school level. We also looked at uh, how funding equity, how equitable funding was across schools when accounting for the variations in student need in each of the school's demographics. And then um, once the dollars go from the central office down to the schools, what does that actually translate into from the student experience standpoint? How often are kids seeing different teachers? How is time being spent throughout the day? What is the relative investment that's being made in ninth grade English as compared to 12th grade electives, for example, through our school design work? Um, that work uh, was the foundation for then a set of priorities laid out by Oakland for their following budgetary season, um, planning for the next year. And in a continued partnership last year, we worked with uh, about half of the high schools serving over two thirds of all high school age students in Oakland to support them through a revised scheduling process so that um, structurally high schools in Oakland would allow students to get the number of credits they need to graduate each year um, in a four year time horizon, which was a key finding from our prior year resource map. Um, so it was an overall two year engagement and um, we are not currently partnering with them, but I've seen the benefits of our work from both the first year of resource map and then also our school based support that happened last year. Okay, thanks Nisha. I'll turn it to Nick. Great, thanks. Um, so I have uh, enjoyed over the past two years working with uh, Indianapolis, Indianapolis Public Schools. And we've been partnered with IPS now for probably three or four years, uh, conducting uh, a wide range of projects focused uh, across many different uh, areas. But interestingly, where I think a lot of our work has been around implementation, and so to sort of just explain what we've done, we've conducted um, an in-depth financial analysis, uh, much like Nisha was mentioning in terms of a resource map. We've helped design and implement their new student-based uh, financial model. We've analyzed their school portfolio and given them recommendations on how they could sort of change and consolidate some of their smaller uh, schools. We've helped train their principals and district staff around uh, strategic school design, as well as helped develop and execute uh, their enrollment projections. And so it's been kind of an exciting time because many uh, projects and uh, partnerships that we've done with them has been very varied and has been sort of uh, very interesting in some of the analytics that we've been uh, responsible for. A lot of my work has been around the implementing of this student-based budgeting 
uh, financial model. And what that kind of entailed starting a year and a half ago was first and foremost facilitating uh, a wide range of discussions and design sessions throughout the district to include principals, the board, um, district staff to better understand what the student need of Indianapolis was and how they were hoping to transform uh, their financial uh, funding model to not just allocate resources uh, by position, but more allocate resources based on the specific student need at schools, uh, giving the principals more flexibility around how they utilize their resources. Uh, beyond just the facilitation aspect, we conducted a, a lot of analysis uh, to look at uh, the student needs specifically with an IPS, how that played out across the district, and then better understanding how dollars uh, were being uh, equitably or not equitably uh, allocated across the district. From the implementation standpoint, uh, I think it's been really exciting and it's been one of the things that I've very much enjoyed about our job. Um, the partnerships uh, that I've sort of made at IPS has been uh, fairly uh, impressive because we have a very strong working relationship with a lot of the individual employees there. And so in some respects, uh, I look back over the past year and a half and feel like I've almost been a uh, employee of IPS, knowing how much time and effort uh, I've been providing them in regards to either a thought partner or the analysis that we're providing for them, or just in general, helping them uh, roll out and engage with uh, various stakeholders. Great. Turn to Roni. Great. So Shelby County Schools, also known as uh, Memphis, is one of our current projects. They are currently planning to roll out their own student-based budgeting formula. So as Nick mentioned, this, this, uh, this is about connecting uh, a school district's funding formula to the needs of the students to ensure that it is, it is more equitable. Uh, but also with this project, we're helping them think about what can principals do now that they'll have more control over the flexibility of their dollars and they'll have more control over the positions in their schools. So we're helping uh, principals uh, go through a process that we call strategic school design in which we help them identify their student needs and we help them think about what is your year one, your year two, and your year three plan and how are you going to make use of all this uh, additional flexibility over your budgets. So for example, we have a couple schools, uh, six schools uh, with which we're providing intensive support uh, for that planning. And many of them have stated that early literacy is uh, one of their student needs. So we're thinking about how can you use um, these newfound resources in order to, to add more intervention blocks to your schedule. We're also providing uh, support to 27 schools for a total of 33. Um, but something that I've definitely enjoyed, as Nick mentioned, is the connections as well. I feel with this project in particular, uh, we get to engage with the school district uh, uh, leaders, such as the CFO, uh, in a systemic level, talking about the formula. But we also get to talk about the principals and the teachers and be able to, uh, to sort of like go into the weeds of the work and talk about what change can a specific school make for their students. Great. Thank you, Nisha, Nick, and Roni. Um, and so as, as you may be able to tell, our district work is the bread and butter of what we do. Um, but we actually do a lot of other things as well. So we work with state departments of education. We do research um, and we put out tools to be used um, in school districts across the nation um, in a do-it-yourself way. So if those are things that you are interested in, um, please go and check those out on our website. Um, so we're now going to move into our Q&A portion um, of the time. Thank you to everyone who shared questions in advance. Um, we'll begin by answering those here. Um, and please remember, keep typing those questions into the chat bar, um, and we'll be turning to your questions in just a few minutes. Um, so the first question that we wanted to hear is, what are the roles that we are hiring for, and what is the difference between those roles? Um, so as we shared, we're hiring for three roles this year. Um, our analyst role um, is our entry level role. We're looking for candidates who are coming to us right from undergrad uh, with coursework in highly analytical fields of study. Um, or we are also looking for people, um, if you have one year of work experience, the analyst role is still the right role for you to apply for. 
Um, the responsibilities of the analyst are doing a lot of data analysis, gener generating insight from data analysis, and developing final work products. So many times that's sort of a deck or a paper. Um, for our associate role, we're looking for candidates with two to three years of work experience, um, either in education, consulting, data analytics, nonprofit. Um, if you have a deep understanding of data analytics from your undergraduate degree, a master's degree is not necessary um, to apply for the associate role. However, we do recommend a master's degree um, for candidates who do not have experience with complex data analysis um, from their undergraduate or their work experience. Um, the way that we differentiate the associate role um, from the analyst role is that the associates are beginning to take on more responsibility for work planning. Um, taking over larger chunks of work streams of projects and doing more um, engagement directly with the district through relationships and, and presentations. Um, the principal associate role, so for this role, um, we're looking for candidates who typically have both deep data analytic work experience um, and often have a master's degree, although that's not a requirement. Um, and the role of the principal associate um, is to lead the data analysis process um, over time, supervising analysts and associates, um, leading the process for their work strand on insight generation, um, and owning relationships with certain district leaders. Um, so the next question um, that we got is, how will I be supported um, when I start at ERS? Um, and we'll have each of the panelists talk about <coughs> One of those. So Nick, kick us off here. Yep. No, thanks. So every year uh, when new hires uh, come into uh, the company in September, uh, the company hosts a two-week uh, new hire orientation. And so when I came through, uh, that was actually one of the things I was most amazed at was the amount of planning and effort that actually goes into it. The whole organization takes part in some form or another. So all of the classes are participated with every single employee within the, uh, the organization. So you get to meet everyone while also learning how the company uh, works. Uh, the whole curriculum throughout the two weeks is based around a project-based curriculum, which helps teach you about sort of how we do the work, what resources are available, and how we work uh, as teams uh, throughout the organization. And so in general, besides helping you become more prepared for the work, you get even more excited, I feel, about the projects and the work that you'll do. Then following the new hire orientation, uh, the many of the employees without, throughout ERS has helped develop an ongoing professional development curriculum that is based uh, around not only the level that you're at, but also the level that you're aspiring to be. So you can basically take your own time and engage with others around the particular curriculum and skills that'll help you uh, sort of master the level that you're at and then also uh, help you achieve uh, that next position. Great, uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, another uh, type of support that, that everyone gets at ERS, and this is something that I just wanna highlight, is something that I think is unique about ERS is that everyone gets a goals and development coach this is a formal structure of support in which uh, this person is, is there to guide you through your own professional growth and really think through what are your areas of growth, but also what are your strengths and helping you to identify those and think about uh, what, does, what does it look a half a year from now or a year from now and how can you capitalize on those strengths. So for example, something that you might do with your goals and development coach uh, is develop a set of goals for, for about five to six months from now in order to, to continuously improve and continuously seek that, that growth. Uh, another set uh, of support is uh, that's a little bit less formal is uh, ERS buddies. Uh, these are folks that are usually the same level as you. Uh, so for example, an analyst would be uh, paired up with another analyst and an associate would be paired up with another associate. Uh, but these uh, folks are there to to give you sort of like since they they have they have been in the organization for at least a year, they can give you some more inside information about any questions that you might have, such as how can I save this in my computer or what should I wear to this type of meeting, et cetera. Um, but it's really more of a informal uh, another support where you can ask questions and, and really come 
in a very safe environment uh, to 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 get any questions answered and to um, talk if you need to do some talking. In addition to the supports that Nick and Roni mentioned, as a consulting company, much of our professional development happens in the context of project teams. And so a typical team uh, is comprised of a partner, a manager, or a principal associate, and two to three associates and, an and analysts. Um, and we work together really to collaboratively and collectively create our best work possible for our partner districts. And so within that, each team approach tends to vary uh, depending on team context and configuration. But typically, there are structures put into place so that there are operating norms within the team. Um, there are health checks that are done throughout the course of a project to see how folks are balancing learning and support and workload overall, just making sure we have a good sense of how everybody's doing, and ongoing conversations for professional development. And so um, in the context of many of, of my project teams, for example, we each have set up one-on-one -on -one uh, check-ins for a half an hour every two weeks to do step backs on how are we doing with respect to our own personal development goals and how can we be supporting one another better so that we both grow faster together um, and get stronger in the process. Um, and that's just a one example of a, sort of a myriad set of supports that exist within both the project teams and ERS at large. Um, our next question was, what does a typical day look like at ERS? Um, and I'm going to ask Roni and Nick to answer this one. Great. So I can kick it off. Uh, so for from an analyst perspective, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the analyst does a lot of the analysis. Uh, but I think what's, what's important to highlight there is that the analyst is not doing the analysis in isolation. It is a collaborative effort in which uh, you, uh, along with your teammates, you would identify what analysis to do. You would take a stab at it, and then you would go back to your teammates, regroup, think about are we going down the correct path, and it becomes this repetitive and iterative process until we get the, the correct product and output that our, that our clients, our partners, deserve. And so just to uh, put more context into, into that, so for example, today I was trying to analyze how different schedules, how much different schedules would cost for schools if, for example, they switch from a seven period day to a six period day. So I, I did my draft, I talked about it with my teammates, and then I did another another draft at it and just presented it to, um, to one of these assistant superintendents uh, about an hour ago. So that's an example of what I did today. But Again, since, since this analysis and it is analytical work, it does vary. And I think that's one of the exciting things about this work is that um, every week and every day is a new adventure. And one thing that I want to highlight, because I knew this was a question that I had as a person uh, who was just coming straight from college, and I'm not sure if some of you have this, but uh, it's, about, it's around traveling. And if people who are analysts or who are coming into the analyst role whether they will travel. Uh, I will say that from my experience, I think that everyone gets to travel at, at ERS. Uh, I know that my experience has been uh, at least some type of monthly travel. Of course, it depends on the project. So that might not be the case for your first or second project, but I do think that eventually everyone gets uh, to travel from both an analyst all the way up to partners. Great, and uh, to sort of build on that, uh, I'd like to start off with Roni's last point. Um, so I uh, have children, and uh, though I do like traveling, it's not something I want to do every day. And so the cool part about ERS and the project structure is that uh, the expectation that we develop with our clients and our partners is that we won't be there, you know, on site 24 hours a day. Uh, but in this instance. I'm usually traveling for two days out of the month, uh, depending on the project. And so I could be gone for an entire month for about two to four days, uh, depending on the project, which I, which I thought sort of fit with what I kind of wanted uh, out of the job. But to sort of bring back what a, a typical day looks like for a principal associate, um, to set the stage, I'm on a few different projects. Uh, so I'm working with Cleveland, uh, Indianapolis, and Baltimore. Um, I coach uh, one of our new hires, and I'm also an active member of our knowledge management and data management team. And uh, ERS has 
uh, a few different teams to help sort of develop the internal processes that we use. And so uh, you will, after typically six months to a year, get an opportunity to join one of those teams. Um, so a typical day will usually um, sort of ha be focused depending on the nature of which project has what due first. And so deadlines would sort of help sort of prioritize what my, where my focus is, but it's not un uncommon for like in the morning to spend a few hours on one project, either in meetings, um, conducting analysis, or uh, maybe discussing uh, with my uh, fellow teammates how to conduct analysis or what analysis they've done themselves. And then in the afternoon, switching gears to either uh, conducting another meeting or preparing for a presentation uh, the following day. Um, again, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, sort of that time management as well as the, the project, project management aspect of the job. I think the biggest difference I've seen moving from associate to uh, principal associate is uh, the time devoted to data analysis versus managing and working across teams. Um, as a PA uh, or principal associate, um, I certainly do my fair share of uh, conducting my own data analysis. But I think as you start to grow in, in the role, you start to realize that you are now responsible for other members of your team. And so you'll spend a lot of your time also um, conducting uh, either thought partnerships or analyzing other people's work and making sure that you've provided the correct checks and making sure that the uh, the whole project as a whole is moving in the direction that you want. Great, and I just wanted to add one more thing uh, that, I, that Nate brought up that I want to make sure to highlight again is that uh, at ERS, there is there are so many opportunities to to take on a leadership role outside of your your traditional projects. Uh, so, for example, uh, right now I'm helping with the Organization Development and Inclusion Committee in which we're really thinking about how to make ERS a more inclusive place. Uh, and I think it's great that someone who, who just wrapped up their, 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 their first year and who just came to their first full-time uh, position to be able to, to impact uh, the organization and the organization's culture. So just wanted to put that as well. It's just not about the, your projects, but also an opportunity to have an impact uh, internally in the organization. Great, thank you. Um, so this one actually will hopefully will help to answer a number of the questions that are coming in, um, is how would each of you describe the culture um, at ERS? And on this one, we'll, we'll start with Nisha. Okay, so uh, I would start first actually highlighting a little bit about ERS's size. So we are um, in some ways small but mighty uh, in that we're small enough where the leadership team can listen to the broader organization and really hear feedback um, and understand where there are things that we want to be doubling down on because their strengths or where there are areas for improvement. Um, and we're big enough where there are systems and structures in place so that you know, you're know you not sort of running around with inefficiencies with, that you might experience in a much smaller organization. Um, you'll see the first bullet here is about our ERS core values. And I would say um, coming from a mission-driven organization, Teach for America, and then now being at ERS, I do think that ERS, each person at ERS lives and breathes the core values in almost every interaction that they have. So we're coming to this work trying to figure out how do we be in best service for our districts and how do we authentically learn from one another and, and how do we speak and interrogate truth together so that we can support one another in the process, both internally and also with our external district partners. Um, and as Roni mentioned, we've uh, had a consistent focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and part of that has been a committee or a task force within ERS um, where our theory of action is that if we get better at talking about issues of race and equity um, and challenges that arise in the workplace, both again, internal to ERS and in our um, work with our district partners that we'll be able to drive greater impact for more students down the line. And so this has been um, an area of focus, so especially for the last two years, born out of a desire to really show up for the cause that we all care deeply about. Great. Um, so I think just to start off with, I love our culture. I'll kind of lay it out there, and I think that's one of the, the strengths that, uh, that ERS has. Um, coming from the Marine Corps, which is really big on camaraderie and sort of uh, working together, 
I think that was one of the things that struck me so powerfully was uh, not only do we put a lot of emphasis on interpersonal and interteam relationships, but we have an extremely flat organization. So those interpersonal relationships not only sort of connect those individuals that you're working directly with, but those individuals that either are at the top end of the organization all the way to the, the bottom of the organization. And so to this end, we have a lot of mechanisms in place that actually ensure our teams and our interpersonal relationships are being, I would say for all intents and purposes, nurtured. We have uh, team kickoffs for all of our projects to make sure that we sort of understand the expectations, understand our working styles, understanding what, you know, what are some of the priorities going on within our life so that the team can help adjust and focus and make sure that everybody is sort of, I think, having the time that they need not only for their project, but then also for their personal lives as well. Um, this helps really norm, I think, the team around expectations, which is great. We have frequent health checks. Uh, where we come back together as a team and ask, you know, how is everybody doing? Is people enjoying their work? Are they feel like they're doing an impact? Are they having fun? And there has been a lot of times where some issue has been sort of surfaced that was uh, not really uh, aware to a lot of the individuals. There's a lot of emphasis to sort of fix and correct, and I would say course correct how the team is working to make sure that everybody uh, is having a great time. And then. Uh, we really, as Nisha had sort of mentioned earlier, have uh, a lot of emphasis on feedback and the feedback, feedback model that we use. And so we put a lot of, uh, or we ensure that a lot of time is set aside for one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions or uh, on-the-spot feedback sessions so that we are providing and making sure that people are aware of not only how they are doing, but how well they're doing and how they can sort of best to improve. And uh, as uh, Roni had said, you know, we have the G&D goals that help us work towards, uh, I think, a lot of our um, interpersonal relationships, as well as a lot of the support structures in place. So um, it's just one of the things I've been so impressed with uh, here at ERS is uh, all of the supports and all of the uh, people that you get to work with. Great. And the, in terms of culture, what I would add is, and Anisha touched upon this a little bit as well, is that people here are just so committed to learning uh, and, and self-improvement uh, for the sake of learning. Uh, and that is reflected in different structures in organization. Uh, so for example, we have uh, innovation days uh, every, uh, every last Friday of the month in which it's the day that is blocked out that if you want to spend that day innovating and, and doing some type of uh, personal and professional growth, you can do that if uh, you can do some research, you can come together as a group, uh, learn something new, learn a new skill. That time is blocked out and you're more than welcome to, to do that. And that is something that I, I, I honestly find very unique about ERS. And um, there are other structures such as our yearly retreat in which everyone, and when I say everyone at ERS comes together for, for this retreat, we all stop working for a couple of days in order to reflect uh, both as individuals and both uh, as an organization as well. And sort of it's a great time to pause and think about where we are, where we have been and where we're going. And uh, there are other structures such as monthly and bi-monthly uh, professional development lunches. Uh, but I, I just think everyone is so committed to learning and to, to, to continuously growing. And I, that's honestly something that has attracted me to ERS. And the last thing I will say is that it's pretty fun. Uh, we have some fun people and we do some fun things. Uh, uh, some of those are structured, some of them are informal. Uh, so for example, I, I hang out with my, with my cohort. So those who joined the organization around the same time as, as I did, we call that a cohort. And so for example, in about two weeks ago, we're going on a, on a bowling match and a bowling, doing some bowling competition. Um, but there are other things that, that, we, that we organize in the organization, such as happy hours, uh, uh, annual cook-offs and bake-offs. Uh, for the bake-off, unfortunately, I did not win. Uh, I tried very hard with, mm -hmm. with uh, some all great cupcakes of mine, but, but uh, one of my colleagues had me beat. But, but yeah, but it's uh, learning and fun. Those, those two things just really mm -hmm. close to my heart. Great. Um, so the, the, before we get into the other questions, the last thing that I want to share with you is how does the interview process work? And we've been getting a, a number of those questions also through the chat bar. 
Um, so even before that phone screen, um, someone asked about the, the due date for your application. Um, so we take applications on a rolling process. Um, so the earlier that you get the application in, the better. Um, because we analyze and we take a look at applications as we receive them um, and we begin the interview process from there. Um, we will likely still be accepting applications um, through the end of the year, potentially into January, um, but I would recommend getting your application in as soon as possible. Um, so once we review the resume um, and if we decide to move you forward to an interview, the first step is a phone interview. Um, it's mainly focused on us getting to know you a little bit. You have an opportunity to ask questions as well. Typically what we're asking on these is, is behavioral questions, just to get to know about you and your experience. Um, we have a second round phone interview as well. Um, that one is focused on analytics. Um, and it's a really fun activity. We actually send you a data set um, from a real school district um, with some questions to answer um, using the data. Um, and then you actually have a phone conversation um, with one of our consultants to talk about the data analysis that you've done. Um, and this is meant to sort of simulate a conversation with a team member um, before you come to that in-person interview, which includes a presentation of the data analysis that you talked about over the phone to a panel of consultants. Um, it includes a case interview um, focused in the education context, so similar to a traditional case, um, and then more behavioral interviewing as well. Um, and then from there, we're typically able to make a, check references and make a decision. Um, and typically from, from start to end, that process should take about four to six weeks. Um, so we are now going to get into our additional questions um, for the panelists. So first I'm going to ask Nick, um, how does ERS get connected to districts? So if I understand that correct question collect, uh, correctly, how are we sort of engaging with or identifying new district partners? Exactly. Um, so for the past two years, I think what I've seen is there's been a lot of interpersonal relationships that we develop at uh, districts. Um, and then as those personnel sort of grow and achieve their own careers, they start moving to other districts and we still keep and maintain those relationships. And so I think a great example is the current CFO at uh, Cleveland right now, um, used to work in Nashville and we had a, a great partnership with them there. And so that has sort of opened up uh, new lanes and uh, new avenues in which to pursue. But I know we have a, a great communications team that I think focuses a lot of effort on not only um, reaching out with various newsletters, but if you kind of go to our website, you'll see that we try to push out a lot of um, tools that are free for districts and schools. And we have a lot of uh, publications that we push out um, for the district and the state level. And so I think just from that perspective, we are pushing out a lot of uh, key information that makes ERS um, a, pretty much a thought leader uh, in a lot of the areas that we're working uh, across the United States. And so um, it's just, uh, as you see, year over year, uh, new partnerships uh, forming uh, across uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, Roni, the next question is for you. Um, how long do relationships with districts typically last? Okay, great. Thank you, Jess. Uh, so I'm going to reword this question a little bit. Uh, so uh, how long do projects last themselves? I'm gonna make a little bit of a distinction between project and relationship. Uh, projects as a whole tend to vary. Um, for example, our typical resource map, which Nisha was talking about with Oakland Unified School District, takes about a year, but that might be combined with another project. So for example, you might have a two to three year project engagement. Uh, what I will say there is that I think it's very rare for one person to be involved with the same project for uh, that long of a time, for, for two to three years. I do think that ERS tries to do a good job of making sure that you're always given a new challenge. So if after, uh, if after a year uh, you feel ready for a new project and the organization thinks that you should have a new project in order for your own pro uh, professional development, then you'll probably get a new project. But um, but yeah, but it varies. It can be one year, it can be two. Uh, we do have a set of smaller and rarer projects that are, are a lot shorter uh, engagements. In terms of relationships, I do think that our partners here at ERS 
try to make sure that we have uh, good working relationships uh, with all of our districts. Um, while we might not be engaged with an active project, we'll probably still stay in contact and we might invite them to uh, different conventions and conferences that we do. So for example, we have a, a, a CFO conference, an Aspen CFO conference, in which uh, various of our past districts tend to attend and therefore we're still keeping that relationship and that impact, but we're not necessarily engaged with them in an active project. Great. Um, so the next question I'm gonna ask to Nisha um, is how do we measure our impact? Um, and what do we consider a job well done? Uh, thanks for the softball question, Jess. Um, so we measure our impact pretty deliberately. Uh, the last thing that we want to be is consultants that come in and try to do work with a district and then say, you should fix A, B, and C, and then walk away and don't actually help them figure out A, B, and C. So as Roni was alluding to earlier, um, our individual project timelines are sometimes shorter than our overall relationship with the district because we stick around often for a follow-on scope to help districts um, actually engage with the specific recommendations and the next steps that come out of our first phase of partnership together. Um, so on the back end of most of our engagement, we delineate out a few metrics that are going to be success measures for us internally, um, which ha often have to do with how we live out our core values as, as internal teams to ERS. And we also have success metrics that we determine in partnership with our partner districts. So that at the end of um, our time together, we can look back and say, okay, well, did we actually uh, get to full implementation of what we were trying to achieve together? And um, so we can sort of take a stock take uh, in process and then we also measure the extent to which we've seen impact in um, building the capacity of those with whom we work. So our ultimate goal is to make ourselves in some ways obsolete with the districts with whom we work. And so if we can leave after our work is done and have the trains continue to run, have the work continue to expand um, the impact over time, then we also consider that a job well done. Great. Um, I'll ask the next one to Nick. Um, so every district has a different, unique situation and circumstances um, and context. So how do you take that into account over the course of your project? Yeah, great. Great question. So I think uh, I'm sort of experiencing this now uh, working across uh, Indianapolis and Baltimore. Um, both similar projects, we're helping them sort of uh, either implement or rethink uh, their current funding formula but the amount of uh, student need, or rather the difference in student need and the difference in history in terms of how uh, those districts have evolved are uh, very different. And so I think, you know, initially uh, with that project kickoff that I kind of had mentioned before, um, that is an opportunity for the team to sort of get their head in the game around who is our partnership with and what context should we be sort of spun up on uh, before actually getting involved in the work. But then I would think a lot of it is around the relationships that we build. And I know so for me, when it comes to a lot of the, the design sessions that we've done either in Indianapolis or Baltimore, a lot of it is meeting with uh, the district personnel, asking the questions, listening, talking with them and just getting a better understanding of why uh, policies and procedures are exist currently, how they form, what was the history behind it, and then making use of that information to sort of create a better and informed, hopefully, uh, solution. And so uh, a lot of it is, I think, reading, but I think a lot of it is also uh, getting to know the people you're working with because they're the ones who are the resident experts. Great. Um, so any of you can jump in and answer this next question. Um, the question is, can you tell me about the project team structure? Um, and the types of roles that are on the team and the different roles that people play. So maybe we'll start with Roni to sort of talk through the overall team structure and then Nisha and Nick can jump in around roles and responsibilities of team members. Great, so again, it varies by project, but I would say that there are sort of like, there are 
couple of categories in each in each team. Uh, you have the partner, which is responsible for for managing uh, the client relationships and sort of a, the project as a whole and making sure that the entire project is going in the right direction. Uh, then you have uh, someone who's filling in the role of the manager. Uh, that person could be uh, the manager level, but it also could be in, in a, pr a principal associate. Uh, so for example, I'm in a team with Nick in which Nick is filling in that sort of like that managerial role. And that person is more, more in the detail and really organizing people and what work they're doing and what analysis they're doing. And then you usually have uh, another, just want to pause right there, that doesn't mean that they're not helping with the analysis. Uh, they could also plug in for the analysis and definitely give a helping hand, but they're also, they're primarily responsible for managing the project and managing the, the people who are doing the work as well. And then you would have uh, the people who are primarily doing the analysis uh, or, um, yeah, we'll, we'll use analysis as an overarching word for it. Uh, but that would be, that's usually an analyst or an associate in, in that category. Uh, how many people are in that team depends on the scope of the project. You might have one of each, therefore uh, three, or you might have more. It might be a total of five. Uh, but those tends to be, from my point of view, the different categories that people tend to fall into. Nick and Nisha, do you, would you agree, disagree? Anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to, I think what's interesting is uh, not only the individuals involved, but it really does matter on the size of the project. So if I could use our example, uh, we're, Roni and I are currently working in Indianapolis together. So it's a partner and him and I, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I feel this is more of a small knit project where Roni and I are pretty much working together. There's a couple of work strands that we've divvied up. He's responsible for one or two, I'm responsible for the other two. Um, together as a whole, we're both engaging with the client uh, or the client leadership and the client uh, partnerships, and we're both on the calls together. We're both uh, taking part in, regard, in regards to the discussions and sort of where the analysis is going to take us. Um, on the flip side, with my Baltimore project, it is more of a larger standard project where we have a partner, a manager, myself, and a, an associate. And so those, I would say, more clearly defined roles and responsibilities sort of play themselves out, I think, in some respects. But for instance, today, I just had a great uh, sort of meeting where it was the manager, myself, and the associate, and we were game planning on, we're brainstorming around how best to facilitate our next design session. And so it was a very collaborative environment where nobody was right, nobody was wrong, and everybody sort of had a say in the matter. So it, it really does, I think, come out in very unique ways, but uh, very satisfying ways across projects. Great. So we are going to wrap up here momentarily, but before we do that, I'm gonna rapid fire some, some answers to the final questions. Um, we have, what is the average tenure of team members here? Um, we don't, we've only been around for 12 years, so it's not a huge end size, um, but typically we see people staying with our organization for about three to five years, um, given that the majority of team members have joined us within the last five years, given our growth. Um, and so that helps us speak to another one of the questions is that ERS is growing. Um, so we, when I joined the organization about three years ago, we had about 40 team members. We now have about 65. Um, and we expect that growth to continue, and we're looking to hire 10 new consultants this year. Um, another question was around sort of average amount of time for promotion. Um, and so we, we have a career path here. Um, theoretically, it goes all the way from analyst to partner. Um, in, in the organization. Uh, because we've only been open for, for 12 years now, we've seen people be promoted from analyst to associate to principal associate, from associate up to manager, um, from pr principal associate up to partner, um, and expect to see that uh, continue. Um, and we do have very clear competencies um, and rubrics and, and sort of ways that people know they're ready for promotion in order for us to be really consistent. Um, and help people define their career paths here with us. 
Um, there was another question about our projects staffed across offices, um, or are all team members in the same office? Um, so we have two offices, um, one in San Francisco and our main office um, here in Massachusetts. Um, projects are staffed with people across offices, so typically we do try to have West Coast travel heavy projects be staffed by folks out in our California office. Um, that office is still small. We opened it last year, um, so we typically do have projects where we have people from, from sort of both of those offices um, part of those projects. So there's a lot of working together through collaborative tools um, that happens. Um, we got a question about traveling. So because travel um, is only a few days a month, um, is it a typical nine to five work schedule, five days in the office? Um, I would say it's a fairly typical um, five days in the work off, it, five days of work in in the office. Um, however, I would not say it's necessarily a nine to five work schedule. I think people can be flexible with those hours. Some people come in early. Um, and leave early, some come, some come in late and stay late. There are certainly crunch times, there are certainly down times as well. Um, so it wouldn't be your sort of typical nine to five necessarily, although we do definitely value work-life balance um, and really try to keep people's hours to um, about 45 hours a week, um, which is very different than traditional consulting. Um, we have a question about, is it possible to work remotely? Um, unfortunately, for team members who are just joining our organization, it is not possible to work remotely. The only people who we do um, provide remote accommodations for are those who have been with the organization for a few years and then have decided to, for personal reasons to move out of the area. Um, and so that is not a possibility um, at this point for new team members. Um, and then the last question that I will answer is someone asked if the schedule or workload follows school schedules, which is a great question. Um, it does change a little bit um, over the summer. We certainly still do have some district work over the summer, um, but a lot of times the work that people are doing over the summer is to really bring our knowledge together um, and do a lot of the internal work that will enable us to really kick off the next year um, and the next year with our, our districts really strong. Um, so with that, we're going to wrap it up. I know there are a few questions that we didn't get answered, um, but we will send out a FAQ um, document that hopefully includes all of those questions after the call. Um, and we thank you for your interest um, in ERS. We thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, we hope it was informative for you, um, and we look forward to reviewing your application. And if you have questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and panelists, thank you um, for taking the time in your evenings um, and day out in California to share your experiences with us. Thank have you. A, have a great night. Thanks. Thanks all.